Amen. Now go ahead and open your Bibles or turn on your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21. And today's message is called New Creation. Now you're probably wondering, why are you preaching, Pastor? Yeah. Yeah. I thought you were on preaching sabbatical. I still am. And I'm still going to be after today. But God has insisted that I preach today. Amen. Amen. And here's what I have learned over the years. In 35 years of being a Christian and 15 years of being a pastor, it's better to comply with Him than to defy Him. That's right. Because His will yes. always prevails. That's right. He always wins. So I just see this time, as instead of me taking a sabbatical from preaching to write my dissertation, so I switch it around and so I'm taking a sabbatical from writing my <laughs> dissertation to preach the Word of God and share it with you. But I believe also that one of the reasons that God wanted me to share this message with you today is he is once again preparing us for our door-to-door -door witnessing on the 14th. You see, because witnessing is at the very core of Christian life. In other words, this is my thesis for you today. This is the main point I have for you today, that witnessing is at the very heart of being a new creation in Christ. Witnessing is at the very heart of being a new creation in Christ. That's why witnessing is the thrust of the New Testament. It is the drive of the New Testament. We see this over and over in time and time again. For instance, in Matthew 28 verse 19, in Mark 16 verse 15, in Acts 1 8, and many other scriptures in the New Testament, we are instructed, we are commanded to go and witness. Why? Because it is at the very heart of being a new creation in Christ. Now the question is this. What does it mean to have this new creation or being a new creature in Christ? And how does having this new life or being a new creation tie in with witnessing? Well, let's find out as we stand now in honor of the reading of God's Word in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 17 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. And if you're there, say a hearty amen. amen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All these is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting man's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him it might become the righteousness of God. You may be seated. Now let's look at the background of the text that we read. 2 Corinthians is the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Christians in Corinth. Now Corinth was an ancient city in the country of Greece. It's about 50 miles west of Athens, one of the bigger cities in Greece even up to now. Now Paul has or had many reasons in writing this personal letter to the Christians in Corinth. One of them is to defend himself because Paul teachers were saying, Paul, that Paul, he's not a real apostle. He is a false apostle. 
So he wrote this letter in order to defend his credibility and his authority as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He also wrote the letter to the Christians in Corinth in order to ask them or to encourage them to make a monetary contribution for the sake of the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem during the time because they were suffering greatly. But not only that, one of the most important themes or reasons that he wrote this letter to the Christians in Corinth is because to emphasize or to reinforce the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, Christ died for you. We learned that in our Lord's Supper time. He became the substitutionary atonement for you. He died on your behalf. And so the reason that you come to church, the reason that you serve, the reason that you give, the reason that you worship, the reason that you witness is because you are in gratitude to what Christ did for you. He died for you. Now, the result of Christ's sacrificial death are in two ways. His sacrificial death led to the new attitude for Christians, for those who are repentant sinners, a new attitude. In other words, a new aim, a new purpose. You see that here in the beginning of chapter 5. In context, Paul was saying, because of the death of Christ, he gave you a new attitude, a new aim, a new purpose. And that is to live a life that is pleasing to him. You see that in verse 9. Which also means this, as you see in verse 15 of chapter 5, he said for you to live your life for Him, no longer for yourself, but for Him. So on a scale of 0 to 10, how would you rate your Christian life in terms of you being pleasing to Him? Are you living your life for Him, or is it still for yourself? Now the second result of the sacrificial death of Christ is here we found in verse 17. Not only that Christians have this new attitude now, but they are also now new creatures. Or they have this new creation status before God. Look at verse 17. Therefore, uh, we always say that, when we read the word therefore in the Bible, we ask the question, what's the therefore? In other words, what was preceded by the therefore? Of course, the precedence of it is that Christ died for them. And because of his sacrificial death, what happened? Here's what happened, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That because of Christ's sacrificial death, on the cross, His atonement for you, He is now making you a new creature. You now have this new creation status before God. In other words, He made you new. That's why we say you have been born again. You are now a born again Christian. In other words, you have this spiritual rebirth. You have been renewed by the Holy Spirit of God. When you receive Christ into your life, you have been born again. Not because that you have changed your religion from this religion to this religion or from this denomination to this denomination. It simply means that you have been given this new life. You are now a new creature in God. You have been spiritually renewed. That's what Paul tells us in Titus 3.5. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. However, it doesn't mean that because now you are a new creature or being a new creation of God, that means perfection. No, it's not. Being a new creature of God means not perfection, but a new conviction. In other words, you are redeemed, so therefore my past, my guilt, my shame, those things does not define me anymore. That's not me anymore because I have been redeemed. I have this new life in me. 
I am a representative of God. I, I focus on God. God has given me this will and power to say no to sin, to say no to Satan. God has given me this power to call sin, sin, and to have a victorious life in all things because of Christ. That's what it means. A new conviction. To illustrate, Mr. Bobby's nephew, Byron, or at my work where he worked, he was known as Keith. Now, just typical of my workplace, if someone dies, the hospital gives them a memorial service. And I was really hoping I would be able to attend the memorial service. And God somehow opened the door. In the middle of the afternoon, I was able to attend Keith's memorial service. So during the memorial service, they were sharing stories about who Keith was, or Byron to Miss Lucy and to Mr. Bobby. And so while they were doing that, as I entered the chapel, they were handing out programs, bulletins, about the memorial and the schedule of what's going to happen. So I was browsing through it. I was opening it and reading it. There's some responsive reading there. And then I turned to the back and a poem caught my attention. The poem's title is, When I Think of Death. Now, lately, we always kind of think of death. Mr. Bobby's nephew passing away. David's father, dad passed away. Last night, we had this horrific shooting again in Odessa. So here of late, we kind of think of death more often than not, don't we? So I was reading this poem by Maya Angelou. Now, I don't know if that's really her name. I did not Google her name. I did not do any research. Because it could easily be a pen name or a writing name or alias of this person, Maya Angelou. So I was reading it, but the last stanza caught my attention, and I'm going to read this to you, okay? She wrote, I answered the heroic question. I, meaning Maya, said, I answered the heroic question. What is the heroic question? What is this powerful question? Death, where is your sting? And it dawned on me, wait a second, that's, that's a Bible verse. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Or death, where is your victory? Remember? It got me excited, and I thought, I wonder what she would say next. So I kept reading, and she wrote this again. I answer the heroic question, death, where is your sting? With this, she said, it is here in my heart, in my mind, in my memories. Wait, wait, a, wait a second, wait a second. It just dawned on me, this person who writes this poem is not a Christian. Why? Because to her, death is a defeat. But to someone who is a new creature of Christ, someone who is a born-again Christian, someone who has a spiritual rebirth, death is our victory. It is not defeat. It is our victory. Look at what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? In a way, kind of the Apostle Paul is like mocking death. And then she, and he said this, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Folks, death is our victory. As the Apostle Paul said it himself in chapter 5, verse 8. That to be away from this body is to be present with the Lord. But that's the attitude of a person who has been born again. Who has been given this new creation status in God. That person sees death as victory, not a defeat. Right. Now let's flesh this out a little bit more in terms of practical sense. What does it mean to have this new creation status? To be a new creation before God? Look at the following verses. The first one is, new creation means we are reconciled to God. 
We are reconciled to God. Look at verses 18 and 19. All this is from God. Now wait a second. All this. It seems like grammatically incorrect because if you go back to the preceding verses, he was talking about a lot of things. So the truth is, henceforth in Greek, it is better translated, all these things are from God, or all these are of God. So now what are all those things that God gave us? The new attitude and the new creation. That's the context of chapter 5. But now look at what it continues to say. Verse 18 to 19. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But look at the beginning of verse 19. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. So to be a new creation in Christ means we have been reconciled with God. Now what does it mean to be reconciled to God? When was I irreconciled from God? When was I separated from God? When was I distanced from God? At the moment you were born. Because of the sin nature that you have, at the moment you were born, you were separated from God, you were distant from God, you have been removed from God. So therefore now, because of our sins, God is holding us accountable and responsible for our own sins. Oh no, not me. God is not holding me responsible for your sin, and God is not holding you responsible for my sin. You are responsible for your own sin before God. But here's what God did. He reconciled us to Himself, which means this. Look at verse 19. He does not hold you responsible because of your sin. Or as He said, He is not going to count your sins against you. Wow. So that means no more judgment for you. The mere fact that you trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that means God is not going to count your sins against you or against me. That means no more punishment for you, no more judgment for you. Instead, you have been given the righteousness of Christ. He covers you with His righteousness. Look at what he said in verse 21. God made him, that's Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Isn't that incredible? Who am I to receive the righteousness of Christ? This sinless, perfect God, his righteousness has been given to me. I'm now covered by His righteousness. And this is what I don't understand based on verse 21. Even at the point of, our, of us sinning, even when we are in the middle of our sinning, praise God, He still sees the righteousness of Christ in us. Right. So even though we are committing that sin, He is not going to hold us responsible for that sin because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't mean, ah, if that's the case, then I'm going to keep on sinning. No, you're not going to do that if you truly have been born again. Because if you have been born again, and you have this new creation status in you, then the last thing you want to do is to sin and displease God. But that means this, folks. That means we are no longer enemies of God. That means we are no longer at odds with God. That means we can come to Him freely because we are no longer the objects of God's wrath. That means we have this freedom to come to Him, to approach Him even when we are in the car, or even when we're taking a bath, or even when we are brushing our teeth, or maybe when we are upset at work, or when maybe we're losing our composure. We can come to Him anytime, anywhere, every time, everywhere. Why? Because you have been reconciled to God. You have been reconciled to God. You are now, or have now, this personal relationship with God. That's why you can approach Him freely even when you're mad. Why? Because you've been reconciled to God. You are no longer His enemy. You are no longer at odds with God. 
And to illustrate, back in the 90s, it's embarrassing to say to you, and I was a Christian then already, and I was even a seminary student then, my brother and I, my oldest brother, had a major spat. And for years, we did not talk to each other. We treated each other as mortal enemies versus blood relatives. Oh yeah, there was no communication, there was no calling, there was no visiting, and that went on and on for several years until I was listening to a sermon of my pastor and he addressed the issue of forgiveness, asking God for apologies, and reconciling with your enemy. And that just convicted my heart. And so I called him up and I apologized to him and I said to him, I have forgiven you and we got reconciled, praise God, in 1998. And ever since that time, we talked to each other, we text each other, we call each other, we visited each other because we have been reconciled. Which, by the way, just in parentheses, maybe that's why God brought you here today. Maybe it's not the understanding what it means to be a new creation, maybe it's to forgive someone. Maybe it's to apologize for a wrong that you know you have done to someone. Maybe God is, 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 is saying to you right now, I brought you here, I want you to listen because I want you to be reconciled with that person that you have something against. Yeah. Perhaps that's why you're but not to digress too far away from our message today. But that's us and God. That's you and, 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 and God. We used to be enemies with God, so there's no talking to God. There's no communing to God. But now we have been reconciled to God. And so now we can approach Him anytime, everywhere, all the time, anywhere. Why? Because we have this personal relationship with God. So perhaps you're thinking, oh, Pastor, I have this personal relationship with God, but how come He's not answering my, my prayers? How come I'm struggling right now? How come I'm in a difficult circumstance right now? Think about this for a second. Think about this. Why would God abandon you or turn His back on you when you are now being reconciled to Him? Listen, listen. If there's only one thing you can take home from this message Perhaps this would be it. Not because God is silent, He is absent. Hear me out. Not because God is silent, He is absent. Not because you don't feel His love, He doesn't love you anymore. He does. Why would God turn His back on you now in your struggles, in your difficulties, when you have been reconciled with God? He's not going to do that to you. You've been reconciled with God. Perhaps though, in parentheses, perhaps you are in that difficult circumstance. Perhaps because you have turned your back on God. Hmm. You know, a lot of times when we come to church as a pastor, it's really hard to tell who's into God and who's not into God. Remember what? But Dr. Blue once said when he was preaching, y'all look good. I hope that you feel the same way. And when you come here, you're all smiling and dressed nice and ready to worship. And some of you are vocal about your faith and excited. But I'm not God. I don't really know if you are in tune with God or out of tune with God. I don't really know if really God is your priority because when you come on Sunday morning, you look so mightily a good Christian. But how about Monday morning? Come on. All right. There you go. All right. Now. Yeah. Or how about Saturday night? Yeah. So it's, it's hard. But perhaps you are struggling and you are in this difficult circumstance and you're saying, right. why God, why God, when you didn't realize, wait a second, let me ask myself, is God still number one in my life? Or is it not the horn frogs? Is God still number one in my life? Or is it now the Dallas Cowboys? Is God still number one in my life? I mean, if God is number one in my life and, and I'm hearing the word of God being preached, I'll be like at the edge of my seat. Why? He's number one in my life. Think of who's the number one in your life. Don't you always prioritize that person? Don't you always make that person special? 
But you always do everything and anything that you can to make this person happy. Why? Because that person is number one in your life. The second meaning of being a new creation in Christ is we are God's ministers of reconciliation. Look at verses 18 and 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And look at the second part of chapter, or rather verse 19. And He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation because you are now a new creature. He has given you a ministry and a message. And let me ask you this. If you have a ministry, would that make you a minister? Well, yeah. Because if you are doing therapy, that makes you a therapist. Mm -hmm. If you are working with electricity, that makes you an electrician. Right? right? right. If you are working with the car, it makes you a mechanic. Yes, yes. If you have a ministry, that makes you a minister. And God has given you a ministry, therefore you are a minister. All right. And your ministry is reconciliation to bring people to God. That's right. That's right. Or as Paul said in verse 20, the second part, he said, This is your message as a minister of reconciliation. Yeah. I implore you, be reconciled to God. In a summary or a nutshell, that's what it means. So now you're asking the question, okay, that is my ministry, I am a minister, so what is my message? Mm, right. Would that make, you, make me a messenger? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. You're not just a minister, you're also a messenger. Your ministry is to reconcile people to God as to your message to deliver, because remember, you're a messenger. You have to say something, and that is once again, be reconciled to God, as Paul said in verse 20. I implore you, be reconciled to God. You know, what's interesting about that is this. First, the word implore literally means to beg, to plea, to entreat. So now, wait a second. Why would I do that? I'm a minister. Why would I beg people? On the second hand, I'm also a messenger of God's Word. So if I'm a minister and I'm a messenger, then I'm a big shot. <laughs> Why would I plead? Why would I implore? Why would I entreat people about the message of reconciliation? Because here it is. The word ministry or minister is not a position. It's not that you become the head honcho of a church where you should be the big time, you should be elevated on the platform, and people should be paying attention to you because you are the minister. I like it when people say, oh, uh, I'm the pastor of this church. My name is Reverend Joe Smith. I love it when they say Reverend. It gives me chills. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> I mean, you're so reverend. You know, you're so respectful. You don't say it. You must be God. <laughs> Reverend. But a minister, you know what it means? The word minister literally means server. Or how about this one? In Greek, it means to wait on tables. Right. Well, think about that for a second. Now suddenly, wait a second, I'm a minister. So that means I wait on tables like a waiter, like a waitress? Yes. That's what it means. God has given you this ministry of reconciliation to plea, to beg, to ask people, be reconciled to God. That is your message as a messenger. But you as a minister is this. Plea to people to be reconciled with God because God wants all people to be reconciled to Him. And so therefore, God wants all Christians to accept the fact and to say it as a privilege that I am waiting on the unbelievers. Yes. That I am serving the unbelievers, the lost, the non-Christians by giving them the message of reconciliation. Hear me out. Hear me out. If there's one thing, once again, you will take home from this message, is this, is, I hope this would be it. Listen, we who are saved 
owe the gospel to the lost. You might want to write it down somewhere. We who are saved owe the gospel to the lost. We owe the gospel message, we owe the message of reconciliation plan of God to the lost. We have an obligation to serve them, to wait them, even if it means to beg them, please be reconciled to God. I beg you, even if I treat you for lunch, be reconciled to God. That's what Paul is saying here. To be reconciled with God. Therefore, God wants all Christians to accept the honor of serving the lost. And here, on September 14th, we'll have this opportunity to become ministers of reconciliation through our door-to-door -door witnessing. You're probably thinking, hey, wait a second, Pastor, why should I participate? I don't know, it might be too hot that day. I don't know if I'll be able to get up early that morning. I don't know if I would be at work or not. Why should I participate in the door-to-door -door witnessing? And you may have a valid reason, but the reason you want to participate is because you are a minister of reconciliation. God has given you a ministry and a message to proclaim. We implore you, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Folks, we live in the great state of Texas. The state of Texas has almost 29 million people. Out of the 29 million people, 19 million people are lost. 19 million people in Texas do not have a personal relationship with Christ. And the best we can do is, oh, I'll pray for them. I'll go to church and worship my God. We owe the gospel to the lost. I hope if there's not the word that's coming out of my mouth, at least you hear my heartbeat. We owe the gospel to the lost. That's why witnessing is at the very heart of being a new creation in Christ. Why? Because it is the very core of who we are. We want to witness. Why? Because we are ministers of reconciliation. God has entrusted us with a message. With a message to be ministers of reconciliation. Hey, just in case you decide to come and participate. Hey, I want to be part of that. What do we do? Well, September 14th, it's a Saturday, you come. Come at 9.45. We're going to have a time of prayer instruction. Now, we're going to be teaming up with others. So, if we, depending on how many people we have here, ideally, I hope we can have three people per team. So, we're going to go to our neighborhood. Now, this for this quarter, for this month, we decided to go to the neighborhood behind Brahms. I figured it's going to be, if it's warm, we go out there, we walk, we get sweaty, and then after that, we go to Brahms and have ice cream. And then, wow, what a deal, isn't it? I mean, why would you not come? But nonetheless, when you go to that neighborhood, we go and knock at people's door. And we say, we are from Camp Rock Church. I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so. And we are just here to pray for you. Is there anything we can pray for you? Sure. They never say no. Unless they completely do not open their door. But when they open the door and say, yeah, please pray for me. It's remarkable. We even receive a card from someone. Thank you for praying for me. People are desperate for God. And so we knock at people's door and say, what can we pray for you? And then after we pray, we ask the, 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 the diagnostic question, the spiritual question. And that is, if you die today, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And of course, they will give their response. And you will know whether they're giving you the right reply or not. So if it's, oh, I'm good, or I am nice, or I am super cute, I used to be a celebrity in Hollywood, well, those are all false answers. We know the answer, and that is to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. He say, what do I do then? Then we read to them the gospel track. That's all you do. You just read it till you get to the very end. At the end, there is a prayer there. You lead the prayer person to pray the prayer. After the person prays a prayer, and you read the entire gospel track, and this person got saved, he say, thank you, Lord. Oh, welcome to the family of God. Here is our church business card. I hope you can come and join and have fellowship with us. I invite you to be my guest. That's what we're going to do. 
that's a privilege. You say, that's, that's hard work, Pastor. No, it's not. It's honoring to God. Why? Because once and for all, I get to be a minister of reconciliation. That finally, I can wait on the unbelievers and say, I implore you, be reconciled to God. And then thirdly, the third meaning of being a new creation in Christ is we are Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's ambassadors. Look at verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. Now, the word ambassador literally means representative. That means you represent Him. In other words, in the sports field, that means you serve as an agent for the player. Or if you are in the political world, then you have a spokesperson. Or if you are also in the government or political world, then if you are representing the United States to another country, then you are an ambassador, a diplomat. In other words, you act and speak on behalf of God. That's an ambassador. You represent Him. Now, if you think of it, that's a tall order, isn't it? Hi, I am representing God. So ask yourself, on a scale of 0 to 10, how am I representing God? Am I representing Him well? If I go visit you at your work, and I ask, hey, how's so-and-so? Would they say, a godly person? I hope so. Now, if I go to your house and visit you and say, hey, I'm just checking on this person. You know, he goes to our church. How is he? I hope that you represent him well at home or even at school. You are an ambassador. You are a representative of God. Now, it doesn't mean because you're a representative of God, you become like this student. I thought the story was funny. may not be to you. And so this student was listening to a, an atheist professor. He was giving a lecture to a college student in a classroom, a good-sized classroom, and he was telling them, there's no God. I mean, what else would the atheist tell you? No God. That's why he's an atheist. So he said, I'm going to prove to you today, there is no God. And after he said that, he yelled so loud. And he said, if there is God, strike me. He pointed to heaven. And he said, if there is God, then you hit me. He stood like that. Well, nothing happened. A few minutes later, nothing happened. And suddenly this student stood up. In the back of the room, big guy. My goodness, 6'3", about almost 300 pounds, probably a college football player, went over there to the professor, and when he got to the professor, he, boom, he clobbered him. He punched him in his face. And he knocked down the professor on the floor. And all bloody, the professor asked, why did you do that? And the student said, well, because God is busy. He sent me to strike you. Oh, uh -huh. you know, we don't want to represent God that way. No, no. We represent God no. by appealing to people to be reconciled to God. Now, what's the difference between being a minister of reconciliation and ambassador of Christ? Here it is. When you are a minister of reconciliation, you come to the people and you plead to them God's message of reconciliation. Guess what? At that moment, God in and through you begins to proclaim the gospel to that person through you. That means God has become the person who's talking, who is there through you. Wow. As an ambassador of Christ, that means... Wherever I go, whatever I do, God is there. I represent Him. So once I begin to open my mouth and tell them about the message of reconciliation as a minister of reconciliation, suddenly God takes over. That's what it means. 
as if he himself is directly witnessing to that person. Now, this past week, I witnessed, or a couple of weeks, I witnessed to several people. Now, most of them, as a matter of fact, just one out of many, actually professed and trusted Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Yay, praise God. But let's say I witnessed to five or six people, only one person made the profession of faith. The rest didn't care. Now, did that discourage me? That most of them did not accept Christ? Not at all. Why? Because every opportunity to witness became like a spiritual AED on my spiritual life. You know what an AED is? An automated external defibrillator? When someone is having a cardiac arrest and people are doing CPR and they're still not able to get a rhythm, remember, they would put the jail in between these two electrode pads and they would do this and they would get put, put it on the chest and they would say, clear, remember that? And then they would put the AED, kaboom, kaboom, right? To revive the person. So every time I would witness, I feel like God is putting his spiritual AED on me. That it puts this shock wave and, and jolt into my spiritual faith and life, and suddenly, boom, boom. Wait a second, I'm a Christian. I ought to be witnessing. It's God for you. God wants you to witness, surely, because witnessing is at the very heart of being a new creation in Christ. But He wants you to witness because He applies those spiritual AEDs on you. Kaboom! to revive your Christian life. Hear me out. Because if you take away witnessing from your Christian life, if you stop witnessing regularly, then your Christian life becomes nominal, mundane, irrelevant, insignificant, boring. Now why am I a Christian? Why do I live a boring Christian life? And what happens when we are bored with our Christian life? We begin to look at other people and we compare ourselves. That person doesn't go to church, but happier than me. How come that person is more money than me and that person is not even a Christian? How come? Well, perhaps because you are living a dull, boring Christian life. You know the solution to that? It's God's spiritual AED. Witness to someone so he can put a jolt of power back into your Christian life. <clears throat> and you realize, I am a new creation. I am a born again Christian. I am not a nobody. I am somebody before God. Because I have been reconciled to God. Hallelujah. But if you don't, then here's what's going to happen. Your Christian life is not only going to be dull, eventually it would even die. Your Christian life is going to die. And here's what God tells us. Three people, Christian leaders, just this last few months, recanted their faith. A singer from Hillsong, perhaps you like that group, a pastor who was also an author recanted his faith. And yet another leader, a Christian leader, he said, I don't believe in God. I have no faith in God anymore. You know what cost them? They stopped witnessing. Why? Because witnessing is at the heart of being a new creation in Christ. Let's pray. Right.